Hopefully those in South Carolina are getting this also. I really appreciate you guys tuning in whenever you do. Uh, our lesson is called Our Souls Cry Out. This is week one. And really our objective, my objective is to change your consciousness so that a lot of the seemingly anomalous, confusing things we experience in life begin to make sense. So I am going to ask you to do some work tonight. I, I don't usually ask you this. I'm going to ask you to take notes. Do not think you're going to remember. If something hits you, do not think you'll remember it. The older I get, the, the more I often think this. I still do it. Like, okay, I don't need to write this down. I miss out on so much. You can start that timer cam for us. Thank you. When you can, when you can. So I want to say, take notes. Do not think you're going to remember this stuff. Just whatever you got to do to write it down, put it on your phone, put it on a, on a card in front of you. Uh, make yourself a reminder. There's concepts you're going to hear that will help you that you're not going to remember. Those things that you write down are going to be the things that we will use for group discussion time. We will not have any group discussion time. This is going to be uh, a mental exercise for you tonight. There's just no way around it. I would prefer to do this in, say, eight weeks, but I don't know if I can get everybody here for eight weeks, so I'm going to do it in, try to do it in three. Tonight's a harder night because this is setting us up for next week. I really want your full attention. I want you to be cognizant of the fact that there's going to be times during tonight that you're going to check out. So when you check out, I want you to bring it back. Just realize, hey, I've checked out. I need to come back. Okay? So what's going to help you with that is taking notes. Because the reason why you're going to zone off sometimes is because you're going to be, things are going to come to mind. Things are going to make sense. You're going to start thinking about your own life, your own stories. That's good. But, but I got to keep moving. So... Uh, don't expect to remember a point that moves you if you do not write it down. I will help you later. If you miss out on something, I can repeat this or even send you the whole outline. So we're going to be taking, sharing our takeaways with the group. Tonight we're going to focus on, this teaching is primarily coming from one place. It's Todd Hall's relational spirituality. Todd Hall's relational spirituality. He is active in his local church. All of this truth he is fleshing out in his local church context. One of the reasons I love his content. He co-authored a book with his wife that he went to school with. Todd Hall's chapter 4. Todd Hall's relational spirituality. Happy to give him credit. I hope to meet him one day. He's been very helpful. Here's what I'm finding. I could give you a list of authors, about 10 authors that I've read in somewhat recent past and what I realize is a lot of them are all talking about the same thing, secular and, and, and non-secular writers. And so what's beginning to happen is these concepts are lining up, and so it, it's creating a more holistic framework. I want to get into some of that today. So a lot of things you have heard me say, even over the last two, three, four, five years, you're going to hear me repeat again, but we're going to take some of those concepts further. In fact, one of the primary concepts I've shared we're actually going to shatter it to some of the reasons and say it's not true anymore. Except for the fact that it is true, but I'm going to show you also how it's not true. Is that helpful enough? Come back to that. So tonight we're setting up for next week. Please, you've got to be here. If you're here tonight, I am so grateful, so grateful you made it. But you've got to be here next week and the week after. This is a package deal. I could easily spend eight weeks going through this. I'm trying to give it to you in three, so what I'm asking you to do is be here for three weeks. Because we're going to cover this material, and I don't know that I'm ever going to talk about it again. you got to get it. <laughs> you got to get it uh, tonight and the next two weeks, okay? Next thing i got to say to you. By the way, if I'm talking too fast, raise your hand. I'm going to repeat what I've said, okay? I want you to track with me. Do you guys need more light to be able to write, take notes? If anybody needs more light, uh, Cam will turn on the lights in the auditorium. This teaching is not just for you. It's not just for you. Although it is for you. <laughs> not just for you. It's also for all your relationships, including your wife or husband, and your children, your coworkers, your friends, your acquaintances. What you will learn will help you prepare you for evangelism even. What you will learn will help 
you understand how we can turn into a religious person. Someone who knows a whole lot about the Bible, but is very little like Jesus in their free time behind closed doors. This will help you understand that. When all is said and done, I am who you say I am. Can I say that again? You think, what did I just say? What does that mean? What is he doing? When all is said and done, I am who you say I am. What I mean by that is we were created for worship. So there's an external force, a reality, concept, idea, community, whatever, that you're going to extract your identity and self-worth from. That starts out with being your caretakers. As a little baby and infant, you're looking up into another set of eyes, another consciousness. We go into hive mind relationally with that other consciousness. And through that, we use that other mind, the other brain, to regulate our emotions for us. And whatever the state is of that other mind, we incorporate into our own consciousness. We take that with us, and that becomes, in large part, the beginning, the prototype, the precursor of how we're going to view God later on down the road. But if I am who you say I am, that statement sets us up for understanding that we need an external reality, something greater than ourselves to tell us who we are. That person is ultimately meant to be, designed to be God. But we listen to other voices. So we have had caretakers that either represented Jesus, God, the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, very well, or not so much. Either way, when we understand this, it can turn into a redemptive win-win situation. Because God is still willing to tell you who you really are. That's important. A couple things you're going to get out of this teaching. You're going to begin to understand how you have come up with, I'm just referred to it, how we've come up with our view of who God is. It starts off with our caretakers and we import that into later on we come to understand that there is God. That can be a good or bad thing. We need to grow into it being an authentic understanding of who God is. Second thing you're going to see in this teaching, not so much tonight but next time, is we usually, with reference to how we handle conflict... With reference to interpersonal relationships, we fall into usually one of two categories, and but we can alternate depending on the situation. That is stonewallers. Meltdown. Stonewallers are meltdown people. Yes. Parents, guardians, aunt, uncle, whoever took care of you growing up. Your primary attachment, as we'll see. So I'm trying to leave it open for people who didn't have biological mom and dad. That's the only reason I'm... Otherwise, parents. It's the simplest. Thank you for asking. Because we, when, when we're under most stress and pressure, things are most difficult, and relationships will cause the worst parts of you to emerge. That's by design. Then we go into our attachment filters of either stonewall or meltdown. And then so what the end result of that is when, pe- when we need love the most, the kind of love that is unconditional like God, is when the people around us are most likely to abandon us. Because they see us as the crazy person. Or the person who wants to hurt us, who is not fair, or whatever it might be. So you're going to get an understanding of that. So one of the things we're going to get out of this teaching is one, how we relate to God, get some understanding on that. Secondly, how to lean in when people need us to love them the most, including the people that are supposed to be closest to you. Is that going to be helpful? Absolutely. It might, and it's also going to explain to you why you're holding back and won't let sometimes people close to you. So, of course, with that, we, we come to understand that Jesus says... Paul says, your heirs, heirs with Christ, if indeed you suffer with him. In order to do the Christian life well, to love other people well, we have to pick up our cross and be willing to follow Jesus into a life of suffering. Like, I like the statement that the test of how long you'll be in ministry is how much pain you can take. I like that because it reflects the idea that suffering is requisite for ministry. Ministry meaning service. 
All right, so having said all that, here is a process I'm gonna give you. I usually give you a three-step process. Journal out your story. Recount your story in the presence of an empathetic slash compassionate witness so that you can thirdly reassign the meaning of that past experience. We've been saying that for a while here. I can't actually tell you where I got it. It's a composite from a lot of different places. I've tried to find out originally where I got it. I haven't been successful in that. But having said that three-step process, here's another way of saying it. The process that we often talk about for healing is working through pain in the presence of love over time. That's a generic way of saying it, but that really does capture it. If you've got, you got to give an elevator speech to someone, you want to capture a process, the process is working through pain in the presence of love over time. If that's happening, then marriage and the church can be very healing and transformative. Usually, when we're experiencing pain, we're experiencing shame. And when we recount our shame, a lot of times with people that are supposed to love us, we only experience more shame. That is to say, more rejection or even betrayal. Someone takes what we've shared with them and they share it with other people they shouldn't have. Hence, shame leads to more shame. What's transformative is sharing shame and experiencing love. But over time, we're going to see a lot of that next week. Now, having said that, let's switch gears a little bit. The abs- and I'm going to set this up. I want, to sh- I want to quote from a variety of authors and then come back to Todd with relational spirituality. You should look that up on Amazon. It's also on Audible. So we're going to go- I want to give you some quotes, some things that you've heard me say around, and then we're going to come back to Todd, and he's going to give us a more explicit definition of some of these things. One of the reasons I like Todd is I've read about a lot of these concepts in a lot of different places I've read about attachment filters, attachment styles, and a lot of different, I never got traction with it. He is saying it in such a way where I can actually move with it and actually it becomes functional in my real life. Okay? So I want you to have this tool in your toolbox. The absence of close relationships, check this out. The absence of close relationships is a health risk factor more important than smoking, obesity, and physical activity in its effect on mortality rates. The absence of close relationships is a health risk factor more important than smoking, obesity, and physical activity in its effect on mortality rates. As a society, we are moving more and more towards isolation and loneliness. The brain is dependent on relationships to develop properly and to organize itself. Now, obviously, I'm always going to say we are made in the image and the likeness of God. God exists in community. God exists in Trinity. The brain is dependent on relationships to develop properly and to organize itself. Our neural connections synchronize with our relational connections. Wiring our relational experiences into our brain circuits. Moreover, when our early relationships are deficient, relationships later in life can lead to significant change in our brains and healing in our souls. We are created for relationships, and relationships remain central to our well being and spiritual development throughout our lives. Can you see the church? I mean, I've been in a lot of different scenarios, like festive celebrations or parties, and a lot of those situations never go deep. In fact, they're designed to stay shallow. Because a lot of times I enter, in my past, before Christ, I would enter into a community setting, and everybody's getting inebriated because everybody's running from their pain. Corporately. So, of course, this is unwritten contract that we're not going to discuss certain things. The church is not like that. So, if we understand that we have to run towards 
our shame, to experience healing from our shame. Can you see how the church is meant to be a beautiful healing place? But then a church can get off track if it makes it all about image. I'm fine, you're fine, we're all fine. We're always preaching about the sin of everybody else besides us. What have I just described? Not a church. So there's a profound sense in which you are a product of the stimulation your brain received during development. Can I say that again? There's a very profound sense in which we are the product of this brain stimulation we receive during development. So we have all these neurons, and whichever ones are stimulated through our environment are the ones our brain is going to decide to keep. Whatever is not stimulated, is not activated, is not going to be wired, the brain is going to discard. So there's a sense in which we are in large part the result of the brain stimulation we received in our developmental years. Now, you say, oh, so don't feel hopeless. Like if, if you say, I didn't have the best brain stimulation, don't feel hopeless. There's a plasticity in the brain. A lot of things can be redeveloped. It's important to acknowledge this, which means to say, which is to say coming out of denial, because there is healing and transformation available. There's a lot of things that you might think are part of your personality that are not essential to your personality. And they could be replaced with something a new discovery of something that is essential to your personality. So we are created for the purpose of of loving, I want to say this, we are created for the purpose of loving relational connections with God and other people. And we are designed such that we grow and develop through relational connections. If you're trying to do church in your spiritual life apart from community and intimate connections, you're doing something, but it's not church. It just... We were designed, built this way. You have to realize God gave us the church for a reason. It is so precious that God himself would die and shed his own blood, give up his life for it. And we think we know better than God who said, oh, the church, you know, that's, that's optional. It, it's so precious that Jesus, who is God, died for it. And it's, it's not just that it's a hobby. It's something our souls desperately need, actually. The, soul, the church is able to accomplish something that a lot of other communities are not. Not that every community, there's other communities that can't be moving in the same direction. But I want you to realize we were created for the purpose of loving relational connections. So imagine you're a person who has their armor on and you're never letting anybody in and no one really actually knows you. Can you imagine how much of your life you're actually missing out on? Is it possibly born and miss out on the very purpose for which you were created? So here we go. We're going to go into some concepts tonight. So this is chapter four of relational, called Relational Knowledge. Subtitle, We Know More Than We Can Say. That's page 97 of Hall's Relational Spirituality. Now, again, this is setting us up for next week. Here's all I'm trying to accomplish tonight, really. I want to give you these concepts. I said I was going to do some other quotes. I'm doing, going to in a minute. I want to teach, I want you to import permanently the concepts of implicit knowledge and explicit knowledge. Okay? I'm going to say it again. I'm going to define them for you. I'm going to make them relevant for you. I want you to take them with you. Your notes is a suitcase I want you to pack up with stuff that's valuable, okay? Now, we have talked about, used the words implicit and explicit in the past, somewhat recent past. Can you remember what it was? With reference to memories. I talked about implicit memories, explicit memories, and this is very closely related. So what I see us doing tonight is we're going to zoom out to see that implicit, explicit memories are actually subcategories with reference to a broader topic. So here it is, definition. There are two fundamentally distinct ways of knowing what scientists refer to as implicit 
gut level slash intuitive knowledge. So implicit, which is gut level, intuitive knowledge, and explicit, which is analytic, propositional knowledge. Sometimes people are one or the other. What we really need to happen for healing, and get ahead of myself, is we need the implicit and the explicit to both be functioning in harmony. So what neuroscientists would say, the nine major categories of your prefrontal cortex to be working together in harmony. But a lot of times we default to one or the other because of trauma, for instance, that we've experienced. Implicit, which means gut level intuitive, intuition. The idea of intuition is you're taking in sensory perception that you're not cognizant of. You think it was just an intuition, meaning often we use it like it's something mystical. When in fact, okay, let me back up and say this. How many of you are consciously thinking about your heart beating right now and your lungs filling with air and your cells replicating and autophagy happening later on tonight, hopefully? There is so much happening with us that we are not kind of in charge of, right? Agreed? How many of you are consciously thinking about saving some brain space for digesting that meal you had earlier? All kinds of things happening. It is it possible that your, your body is taking in information and processing it in, in ways and areas that you're not even aware of, and that those intuitions, I'm calling them, because I'm bringing them out of the realm of mystical, those intuitions are responsible for how, in some sense, how you're engaging the world? And is it possible that those intuitions can be reprogrammed so that you experience things in this life in a different way? I say gut level. Let me define it for you. Gut level is used to refer to the innate or deeply rooted or instinctive feelings, especially as opposed to intellectual or rational ones. So something that's innate or inherent or intrinsic or essential. Gut level. Deeply rooted. Now, when we start to understand implicit and explicit, you're going to say that, oh, I see what that is. That's actually not gut level. Now, have you seen, I, haven't, I, I meant to bring, uh, look it up a bunch of times in the King James, the idea of being moved in your very, the depth of your bowels, the King James would say. And we're like, oh, the King James got it wrong. And maybe, the, 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 maybe they misunderstood the original language. Um, our brains do all the thinking. That's actually, King James had it right. And we call this a visceral response, which means your body organs. These organs here. You ever notice when you experience pain, if certain, you see someone experience pain, do you feel, have you uh, got enough self-awareness to realize when you, where in your body you feel that? That's a very real phenomenon. And it's different places depending on what you're seeing, right? You watch a movie? You guys have that happen when we watched the one last Wednesday? Your mind, your consciousness is understanding some things and is manifesting that understanding through giving you a physical sensation in areas of your body. So this reminds us of the book, uh, The Body Keeps the Score by van der Kolk. So that's gut level. Intuitive is this, is this intuitive. Intuit. Using or based on what one feels to be true, even without conscious reasoning. Instinctive. I had an intuitive conviction that there was something unsound in him. Okay. So you notice gut level and intuitive are used as opposite of rational thinking. So there's a sense in which we have, we've, the way we're, direction we're going is emotional Gut level, intuitive versus thinking or knowledge versus explicit or rational, something we're more aware of. Or analytic. Analytic being relating to or using analysis or logical reasoning. Analysis. Detailed examination of the elements or structure of something. Have you guys... uh, Familiar with the book uh, Thinking Fast and Slow? Thinking Fast and Slow is the same thing, which is like high road and low road thinking. I'm just using the same 
terms for the same con- uh, concepts. So thinking fast would be implicit. Thinking slow would be explicit. So, you know, the, the idea of thinking slow is you're, you're letting your brain do the thinking for you, and then you, you check in with your brain to see what you come up with. And then you, and then that, so that's thinking fast. Thinking slow is the idea of, okay, I better check the math on what my fast brain just did. Analysis, detailed examination of the elements or structure of something. That's thinking slow. Propositional, a statement or assertion that expresses a judgment or opinion. So propositional, analytic, rational, logical are all what we mean by explicit knowledge. Okay? Versus the implicit thing, and I had an intuition. I didn't, I didn't think that guy was, was a good guy. I had a, a bad feeling about that person. Okay? Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Well, I'll say this, just to make sure we understand. The way I like to think of the implicit thing is your implicit knowledge is like, is using your emotions as a communication network. And I like to go even further. This, this, so your, your, here's how I like to, like to think of it. Your soul is using emotions to communicate with your consciousness. Here we go. A couple uh, quotes from different places. Proponents, proponents of emotional choice theory criticize rationalism. Here's a quote. Here it is already. Proponents of emotional choice. Now, if I say emotional choice, what category are you thinking between implicit, explicit? Which one? Emotional choice would be implicit. So people that get this, uh, you know, are tuned into this idea of implicit knowledge, i.e. emotional choice theory, they criticize rationalism. I'm thinking I'm a logical, analytic person, which I love to be. Next week you're going to find out, I, you might find out why I like that. You might find out why you like the idea of rational thinking versus emotional thinking. Got to come back. They criticize rationalism by drawing on new findings from emotion research in psychology and neuroscience. They point out that the rationalist paradigm is generally based on the assumption that, you rationalist Dr. Spock thinkers, you think thinking rationally and logically is better, but it's based on an assumption. A lot of times our assumptions go unchecked. Because like these glasses, I'm not looking at the glasses, I'm looking through the glasses. That's what we do with assumptions. We look through the assumption. What is this assumption? You, Dr. Spock people, assume that decision making is a conscious and reflective process based on thoughts and beliefs. Isn't it though? It presumes that people decide on the basis of calculation and deliberation. Of course we do. I deliberate, I calculate, and I conclude. That's how I live my life, right? Don't you dare tell me different. However, cumulative research in neuroscience suggests that only a small part of the brain's activities operate on the level of conscious reflection. The vast majority of its activities consist of unconscious appraisals and emotions. Ooh. Okay, so I told you there's a, there's a network that I like to use, and I said it's not true, but it is true. I'm going to just get it out there ahead of time. We often say, I often say, beliefs lead to thoughts, lead to emotions, lead to, fourth and finally, our actions. But according to that quote, emotions has to be inserted into maybe the first step and mixed with beliefs somehow. Like if beliefs and emotions go together, the result of that is my thoughts leading to my actions. Is that a possibility? Is that a possibility? 
So I want to say what, where we'll end up down the road is both of those things are true. Both of those sequences are true. It's just depending on if we're talking about implicit knowledge versus explicit knowledge. We're going to come back to that. Peter Levine explains, quote, conscious explicit memory is only the proverbial tip of the very deep and mighty iceberg. It barely hints at the submerged strata of primal implicit experience that moves us in the ways the conscious mind can only begin to imagine. What is he saying? The iceberg beneath the surface, the things that actually move the majority of what we do in life, is the implicit knowledge. So it's possible that in some sense I am deceived if I think everything I do in my life is rational, is based on rational deliberation. And if you doubt any of this, we're going to back it up, okay? We're just getting you interested right now. Emotions are a communication network. Here's what I already said. This is probably my quote. Emotions are a communication network for your implicit knowledge to communicate to your explicit knowledge. When people don't like what their implicit network is communicating, then they look for a corrective emotional experience. Okay, so really your emotions stand at a segue between the external, your external environment and your internal environment. In between, where those two things coalesce, stands your emotions. Now, if emotions are sending signals, information, communication to my consciousness, and what if I don't like that signal? What do I do? What do Americans do? What do humans do a lot of the time? And but we seek a corrective emotional experience. That's from Frank Anderson. A corrective emotional experience might be what? What am I talking about? I don't like the emotions. My soul is sending me. I turn that into a corrective emotional experience, which means what I'm talking about is a negative coping strategy. I'm going to artificially change my emotions. Drugs, alcohol, pornography. Aren't there a whole bunch of pharmaceuticals? Aren't there a whole bunch of ways to do this? The problem is when those things wear off, my soul's still here like, okay, I've been here waiting. I'm still have the same message. Nothing's changed. Okay, we're going to have to up the dose. I'll just keep waiting. That is why we say the addiction is not the problem. It's an attempt to solve a problem. What's the problem? The negative emotions I'm experiencing. So what we need to do, what the Bible calls us to do, is go back to realize, to, to, help, to seek and pursue. Why is your soul producing those negative emotions to begin with? Now, you can spend a lifetime running from those things, but think about what you might be missing out on. Think about the damage you could be causing to people around you. So many of the coping strategies, the problem with those also is, they cloud your mind so that the possibility of processing gets further and further away clouding my mind. I'm not thinking straight. The idea, so I need to process it so that the emotion can outlive its usefulness because it's getting the signal, message received. I need to process it, but through altered states of consciousness, my mind gets cloudy and I get less and less of a possibility of processing those things health in a healthy way. So what humans really need in these moments, can you imagine what we actually need? You know I'm a pastor, right? What humans really need in these moments is to hear something. Can you guess what it is? I love you. And you're going to be okay. Who ultimately can only say that and mean it? Who? God. God. Now we say that as an expression of his love, and we mean it and it's true, but God is the only one who can actually say, I love you, and you're going to be okay. He can say that because he can make it okay. We, in order to heal, we need someone bigger than ourselves, external to ourselves, to tell us who we really are. Otherwise, we're looking for an emotional, corrective experience that is likely going to be destructive over time. May not be 
you know, uh, you might experience all the consequences the n- next day, but they have a tendency to catch up with you. Matt, now remember, God is telling us the truth because he desires us to flourish. He wants to have a relationship with us. I'm setting the stage for next week. The emotions and physical sensations that were imprinted during any trauma we've experienced, they're not experienced as memories a lot of times, but as disruptive physical reactions in the present. You guys remember that one? Quote or blast from the past? We don't experience trauma from the past often, sometimes, but not all the time. Sometimes we experience that as a feeling of angst or numbness. As a disruptive physical reaction in the present. What is that? So when we said that quote, what am I actually, I'm talking about implicit knowledge. Another one. When we are in states dominated by our emotional brains, we are unable to learn from experience. But instead, we are uptight, inflexible, stubborn, and or depressed, unable to achieve a state of creativity or playfulness. There is a reason for that. So, uh, positive, I'm getting ahead of myself, but positive emotions can, uh, we have a range of thoughts that can happen as a result of feeling positive emotions. And those influence in a way, us in a way that we do certain things that yield benefits, not in the immediate, but down the road. However, negative emotions are communicating to us a very limited set of options. Very limited. Fight or flight. It's narrowing down. So imagine if we're in a state of fight or flight, survival mode, and we're having these things that are influencing our consciousness. Can you imagine how we're seeing the world through very few options, fight or flight, most of the time? We can't go into a state of flow or creativity to create the world that God is designing us to to cause cause people around us to flourish, including ourselves, because we're living out of those negative emotions because the problem actually hasn't been dealt with. As opposed to a state of creativity and playfulness where you could have had that, come up with that idea that would have maybe fed your family and created good for the community at large. So the goal when we've experienced trauma, is to bring our emotional and rational brains back into balance. I'm getting ahead of myself again. Bringing our emotional and rational brains back into balance. I've just described two activities that are supposed to happen a lot in the church. Can you guess what they are? Worship and prayer. Worship and prayer both have rational, propositional content Connected to, guess what? Emotion. This is bringing you back into a state of harmony, a state of healing. That's preparing you to receive truth. Can you imagine if we don't have worship in our life, if we don't have prayer in our life? I'm going to prove that to you more down the road. We want to bring our emotional and rational brains back into balance so we can feel in control with how we respond to situations in life. So we are no longer triggered into states of hyper or hypo arousal. So that we are no longer continually pushed outside our window of tolerance, outside our range of optimal functioning when we are triggered. We become reactive and disorganized and our filters stop working. Unwanted images from the past may invade our minds. We panic and fly into rages, or we shut down and feel numb. So, you notice I just contradicted myself. I said before, emotions and physical sensations that were imprinted don't necessarily manifest themselves as memories. What I mean by that is they don't necessarily manifest themselves as images. But sometimes they do, and those images have to be turned into words. I think of it as a zipper. <laughs> That's the way I think of it. A zipper has to be zipped up. And one side of the zipper is implicit, and the other side of the zipper is explicit, and you've got to zip up the zipper. They've got to come back into harmony. That just works for me. Okay? You. you like it? Thank you. <laughs> we should, yeah. The only way we can access our emotional brain is through self-awareness, 
we have to access the part of our brain, which is the medial prefrontal cortex, that notices what is going on inside of us and allows us to feel what we are feeling. Imagine if we're in the habit of just stuffing everything down. Okay. So, having said all that, I want to give you another blanket process statement. Here it is. The overarching... Let me back up and set it up because you think I'm crazy. There's a lot of uh, kinds of counseling and therapy out there, right? There's, there's biblical counseling. I'm a big fan. There's all kinds of stuff out there. A lot of it's helpful. But there, uh, one way of looking at all that is to say this. The overarching goal of therapy slash counseling is to convert implicit memory to explicit memory. That is the underlying process. This is why we like tell stories. By the way, the whole idea of story, story itself is explicit knowledge linked inextricably with emotional content. This is exactly why the Bible is written in the form of narrative instead of a systematic theology which I would have preferred in seminary. Hope that made sense. So the over, I'll say it again. The overarching goal of therapy is to convert implicit memory to explicit memory. So both forms of knowing are important, and the integration of the two is especially important. Implicit <coughs> relational knowledge is particularly important and foundational for spiritual transformation. Okay, now this is not to minimize doctrine. I, when I, this is not to minimize, I like doctrine. I just want to be clear about that. I really like doctrine. But it is possible that knowledge just puffs up. Remember the Bible talks about this idea that knowledge can just puff up? I can know a, lot, a whole lot of doctrine and just have a really big puffy head. And actually, you get me in a conflict or cut me off in the parking lot, you're not going to see much of Jesus. You're going to see a lot of Matthew 23. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. You're going to see a lot of that. So this is not to minimize doctrine or teaching and explicit knowledge. Remember, I'm a fan of rational analysis, propositional analytic thought. I like it. But rather than understanding, but rather than understanding that through the enlightenment, there was an overemphasis on the explicit with the minimizing of the implicit. So Hall argues that in the patristic fathers, early Christians, first few centuries after Christ, we had something called that were maybe more popular in the church than today, um, spiritual disciplines. Spiritual disciplines is the idea of impl- implicit and explicit knowledge coming together. Okay, so there is, there is a history here. So here's the idea and possibility of the religious person, meaning a person who knows much doctrine, as I said, but is spiritually immature, lacks self-awareness, and looks little like Christ. Emotion previously was viewed as, this started to turn around in the 1990s. So that to me seems like yesterday. And I remember these ideas even in my formal training in college and, and elsewhere. Emotion previously was viewed as, can you guess what? A disrupting force. Cognitive noise that needs to be turned down, like static. On a radio, I mean. Or back before cable. You know, you used to turn on the TV and it was black and white snow. Some of you remember this. Disrupting force, but emotion is now understood to be a broad organizing force in human functioning. It increasingly seems that emotion provides the broad context of meaning that organizes and influences all information processing. Emotion can be thought of as an implicit form of knowledge about ourselves and the environment as we perceive it. And I just said the same thing I already said. Emotions are standing in that segue between our external environment and our internal environment. And emotions, implicit knowledge, is looking in both directions. 
So I think of emotions, oh God, I already said it, as that information network that our souls use to get in contact with our consciousness. Implicit knowledge speaks in and through the language of, what's the language? So I'm speak, what? I'm, I, no, uh, let me back up. I'm right now using explicit knowledge, I'm using language of English to communicate to you right now, right? The lang- that's the language of, think of it this way, of explicit knowledge. The language of implicit knowledge is emotion. So I want to think of emotion as language. And what does language do? It communicates. Okay, so that's a very different idea than the idea that emotions is a disrupting force or cognitive noise. I say language because language communicates meaning and content. Isn't that what language does? Language is used to communicate between two people, two or more people. But here, language as emotion is used to communicate between the immaterial parts of ourselves. To communicate between, one way of looking at it, to communicate between our soul or immaterial part of ourselves and our consciousness. So it's like, it's trying to bring knowledge up above the surface to the limited spectrum of things that we're aware of. Remember I said, you're not thinking about your digestion right now. You're not thinking about your heart beating. You're not thinking about taking oxygen from the blood that we just picked up in your lungs a moment ago, right? Mitosis. So emotions is like, okay, we're trying to make that limited frame of consciousness aware of something, okay? So I'm thinking of autonomic and then sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous systems. I wish I could get into that. We don't have time for time. Think of implicit knowledge as appraising the meaning of internal and external events for our well-being and emotions as the communication of that appraisal. So I want to say that again. Think of implicit knowledge as appraising the meaning of internal and external events for our well-being and emotions as the communication of that appraisal. How are things in, inside you? Your internal dialogue. How are things going? How are things externally in your environment? Are they happy or sad? Should you be afraid? Are you okay? The brain and emotion. The brain is connected to two worlds. As I said, <laughs> I keep saying I'm getting ahead of myself. Are two sources of information, the world inside our bodies or in its internal environment and the world outside our bodies or the external environment. The brain stands at the crossroads of our internal and external environments. The brain tells us whether something in the external environment is good or bad by making that thing feel good or bad. That seems brilliant. Like, a lot of times words have no emotional content. Like, I can say bad doesn't make you feel bad, does it? I can say evil. You're not overcome by evil when I say that word. Words don't have that kind of force or power, do they? No, they can, to some degree. A very uh, persuasive, dynamic, charismatic speaker can make you feel. But, like, that's just like a drop in the bucket compared to implicit knowledge where the whole way it's communicating to you is by making you feel good or bad. Doesn't have to, isn't, I think it's brilliant. Or something on that spectrum between good and bad. Thus we constantly experience a nonverbal, non-reflective evaluation of how we are doing with respect to our body and the outside world, we might say that evaluation is what emotion is for. And emotion, along with relationships, is what our bodies are for. (sighs) What? Now, you remember I said we are designed, built by God for relationships. Ultimately, the relationship we're designed for is to be in relationship with God. So he had to build us with these components that would allow us to interface with him. Isn't that amazing? So there's a sense in which all this other stuff going on with me is just necessary to the overarching purpose. You think, is that delimiting for you or is that like opening your consciousness? Like what is that doing for you? Does that make you feel small or big? So I want to say that last part again. We might say that evaluation is what emotion is for. 
Are things good or are they bad, internally, externally? That's what emotion's for, let me know. And emotion, along with relationships, is what our bodies are for, are for. God gave me this body, not just for long walks on the beach, okay? He gave me this body, ultimately, to be in relationship with Him, and this body is helpful because it allows me to feel emotions. And those emotions allow me to be in interface with my Maker and other people in the community that God is also interested in interfacing with. Like, God designed me for this community. Can you imagine how, I could say, evil it is for Satan to trick us in certain ways to, 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 would desire, to cause us to desire to live in isolation? The idea of virtual church. We have the headset, and I see virtual you, and you see virtual me. And we do virtual baptisms. Is that moving in the direction of God's design or away? I'll, I'll leave you to answer that. But that is a real thing that I saw during COVID uh, lockdown. Maybe it has its place. The state of the environment inside the body and our brain's representation of that state can be broadly understood as emotion. What your emotion systems perceive in any given situation is, this is, okay, this is good, is subjective. We, you and I might walk into the same room, same environment, and I'm excited and you're like depressed or vice versa. Like you immediately want to leave, immediately want to leave, and I immediately want to rush in, or vice versa. It's subjective. You might walk into a room, you feel great. I walk into a room and I feel terrible. It's subjective. It's based in part on implicit. This is helpful. What's the difference between good and bad? Two people. It's based in part on implicit memory of past experiences. I want to put something in parentheses for you. It's based in part on implicit, that is to say, bodily memory. Those memories you're bringing with you into the present are dictating, are the lens through which you perceive your environment, and your emotions, of course, are ticking off as either good or bad. So when you experience an emotion, what you experience in your, is your own subjective, here's why I want to use the word visceral, like King James uses the word bowels, Visceral meaning your internal organs. What you experience is your own subjective or visceral response to an event, not the direct event itself. To state it differently, you experience the unique subjective meaning of an event to you, which is an evaluation inherent in the state of your internal environment. So another way to say that is, I'm projecting upon the present the past that I'm carrying with me. So, you know, you ever hang out with Jeff Swanson? I'm going to pick on him for a little bit. You know, he, he's always such an optimist. Now, I think he's justified in this because if he says, oh, everything will be fine, it usually is. I'm more skeptical. Like, okay, I'm going to look out for all the problems. Why is that? Now, I want to, I want to say well, my skepticism is helpful. <laughs> and we need each other to balance each other out. But is it possible that I'm bringing some pain into my present? And maybe I've been let down in the past and I expect to be let down in the present. And maybe Jeff is correcting me and saying, hey, maybe we should have some faith here. And what is faith? This is my highlight for the end of tonight. Oh, in case you, you fall asleep. Truth plus relationship equals faith. We say faith is not just propositional content. When I say that, I mean it's not just explicit knowledge. Faith is a relationship. It's loyalty. It's allegiance, which is to say it's truth plus relationship. That's faith. What does Jesus say in his high priestly prayer in John 17, 3? He says that this is life, that they may know you. The truth he wants you to know is a relational truth. So there's this idea in the New Testament of having faith, and that's that relational element. So God wants to have that relationship with you. I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's talk about depression for just a moment. Depression, so we talk about the sequence of Belief, thoughts, emotions, 
actions. Now we're switching it up because we're saying that's explicit sequence. The implicit sequence is emotions slash beliefs lead to thoughts, lead to actions on the implicit level. So the example of depression. Depression demonstrates the global influence of emotions on conscious memory and explicit thought. When people wake up depressed, they report that everything seems worse than the day before, even though they know intellectually and explicitly that their life situation has not changed. Their explicit thoughts have de become depressive and negative because the lens through which they see the world is their emotional state. Do you guys get that as an example? So I say I'm depressed, then I interpret everything as being bad. And in, that, and in that way, my emotions are leading to my perception of the outside world. So I could say that in that way, my emotions are leading to my thoughts or leading to my actions. I don't want to go outside today. So the end, is, the end sequence or action is a result of a thought. The thought is, I don't feel good, which is based off an emotion of depression, let's say, which desires isolation, let's say. Okay. Emotions then provide a powerful source of information because they are processed automatically and outside of our direct control. Our emotional responses provide the clearest window into the deepest level of our soul. This is Hall, page 104. The deepest level of our soul. The meanings we connect to relationships and events in our lives. So emotions are telling us, communicating to us the, the meaning that we're assigning to the circumstances or the person, the relationship, whatever it is. We cannot manipulate the emotional meaning we assign to events. So they reveal what we really believe at a gut level about ourselves and others in our relational world. <clears throat> now, I think you can manipulate them through drugs. But again, that's going to wear off. This does not mean we encourage people to do whatever they feel like doing if it is something that clearly goes against God's design. However, it does mean that we want to be transformed at the very core of our being, we must start with our emotional responses because they comprise an implicit form of relational knowledge that guides our sense of self and how we relate to God and others. So we're not saying, hey, do whatever you feel like. We're saying, hey, pay attention to the feelings. And in order to get right, we need to go back into the very core of who we are and work on that and let God, the presence of God, transform that, and then everything else will work itself out. Emotion is the way we evaluate the meaning of our experiences with respect to our well-being. Evaluative emotion systems leads to a cascade of changes in the brain and body that are manifested in four highly related components. So a cascade of changes. So think of, well, here they are. One, changes in the viscera, that's your internal organs. Changes in the motor and behavioral expressions of emotion. Motor and behavioral expressions of emotion, including the readiness for responses and the flow from these changes. So when it says motor expression, think of your micro expressions on your face. Maybe come into contact with someone you don't like. Your face is going to give that away. So you shouldn't, what we're saying is you just don't work on trying to not have those micro expressions. You want to be transformed at your core so you, don't, so you no longer see, perceive that person as being a threat. Wouldn't that be a better, more authentic way of doing it? But that's not how we do it in church a lot of times, sadly. We just like, okay, let's just fake it till we make it. Right? I don't like you at all, but I'll, you'll never find that out. <laughs> right? <laughs> Sorry about that. The subjective experience that arises from all these changes, and fourthly, cognitive appraisal of the stimuli and situations. That was a little cerebral. When we perceive danger, the fear system, one of the four basic emotion command systems in the brain, the fear system, is triggered. Danger. When danger is computed, the brain circuits that process this, this, this cause changes in the viscera through two mechanisms. Okay, so 
it, your emotions are alerting you to danger. It's firing off some brain circuits. It's, a, it's alerting you through your internal organs through two ways, neurotransmitters and hormones released in the bloodstream that exert their own effect on the viscera. When our fear system is activated, we, achieve, we experience a number of visceral changes, including increased heart rate, more shallow and rapid breathing, a redistribution of blood from our gut to our skeletal muscles, and all of this takes place automatically without our having to think about it in order to prepare us to deal with potential danger. I'm wondering if, if eyes uh, contracting would, would be involved, uh, included. This reminds, <coughs> reminds us that emotion is inherently evaluative and that the evaluation is always with reference to our well-being. The way our emotion systems determine well-being is highly influenced by our primary environment, including our relational environment. So you think about what is your primary environment? What is your primary relational environment? So for instance, if things are not good at home, it's going to be pretty hard to fake it out in the world. Emotion also involves a motor expression or discharge. Emotions cause us to want to do something. They give us an urge to act in certain ways. Externally, emotion is manifested in several ways, such as through changes in facial expressions, crying, blushing, and in more complex behaviors like lashing out or isolating oneself. The brain circuits that process the subjective experience of emotion generate pleasurable and unpleasurable sensations. This sets the qualitative range of the subjective experience of emotion. Unpleasure is different from pain, as we typically use the latter term. Pain refers to a somatic, it means body, somatic sensation, whereas unpleasure is a psychological subjective experience based on the state of the viscera and urges to act in certain ways. So what I'm saying is if we understand all this, what we can get our heads wrapped around is be practicing more self-awareness. Because the alternative to this self-awareness is living a life where we stuff everything down and ignore it. And that is, as we often say, the very place the Holy Spirit wants to go. God, God's love wants to go into the locked closets. So we, if that's the case, and we're, we're sweeping everything under the rug, as it were, then we may not have physical pain. Of course, we might. We may not have physical pain, but we have unpleasure. Can you imagine going through life, having a sense of unpleasure pretty much on a regular basis? And can you see a quick side note of why cutting would be a thing? Someone has this pervasive sense of unpleasure, psychological pain, that they would use physical pain as a distraction from it. The brain circuits that process, you're doing really good guys, keep it up, we're almost done. The brain circuits that process the subjective experience of emotion generate pleasurable and unpleasurable sensations. Oh, sorry, I just read that. There is also a cognitive appraisal component to, let's talk about Frank, Frank's emotion. There's a cognitive appraisal. I want to give you a, use an illustration of Frank to, and you see if you recognize this in your own life. Frank is a wartime veteran, okay, with PTSD. So Frank's, um, it has this response to a loud, sudden noise. Frank's initial reaction may include feeling fear, which is a quick and dirty processing of the stimulus information, a first rough take processed by the low road, thinking fast, low road, and which information is input into the thalamus and then sent straight to the amygdala. Simultaneously, but more slowly, the stimulus information is processed in a more precise way via the high road, thinking slow. In this pathway, information is sent from the thalamus to the sensory cortex and hippocampus, and then to the amygdala, where it processes the meaning of the stimuli already computed via the low road, thinking fast. Thus, after Frank's initial reaction, his brain may process that his neighbor has a truck that often backfires, and that the noise he heard sounded very similar to previous instances of the truck truck backfiring. 
He may also process information about his current life situation, that the war is over and that he is in a safe place. All this information then gets processed in the amygdala, causing a reduction in physiological arousal, the urge to run, and the subjective experience of fear. So his immediate response, his gut level response is, I'm, someone's got a gun. But then he processes it more slowly and realizes, talks himself off the ledge, as it were, and realizes, oh, that's just a car backfiring. I already know about that. And he begins to calm down. So that's low road and high road. Uh, again, the same as Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow uh, 2013. So do you guys, you relate to those experiences in your own life some, in some ways? You want to pay attention to those. Those need to be deciphered. Recent research suggests that positive, like joy, interest, contentment, and negative, sadness, fear, anger, emotions, may function somewhat differently. This is what I said this before. I want to say it again. I want you to take this with you. Negative emotions aid us in survival by facilitating a narrow range of specific actions such as fight or flight. We could add two more, freeze or fawn. In order to do this, negative emotions evoke very specific, limited, visceral responses which facilitate actions that are helpful for our, for our survival. For example, fear causes increased cardiovascular activity in order to pump blood to the muscles necessary for flight. In contrast, positive emotions broaden the available action possibilities, enabling greater behavioral flexibility in ways that enhance the personal resources in the long term. Rather than being associated with specific cardiovascular patterns, positive emotions help to undo cardiovascular reactivity, returning the body to neutral levels of activation consistent with a broad range of behavioral responses. Put another way, negative emotions help us in the short term, whereas positive emotions help us in the long term. Like, if you're in danger, your brain's saying, give them two options. We don't have a lot of time to go in detail. Fight or flight, that's all you get. Because you have to survive. Can you imagine living a life that way? If the implicit knowledge that we're carrying with us is our environment is bad, our internal environment is bad, our external environment is bad, can you imagine, you're living, can you imagine what would be the outcome of your life? Would you, would you have a broad, expansive expression of your spiritual gifts, gifts being used to help the community at large flourish? Or do you think, would you live in more of a scarcity mindset, like there's not enough resources to go around and I have to hoard it in isolation from other people who are trying to betray me and hurt me? Can you imagine, like I'm, I'm being extreme here, but we get the point? The word feeling, I wanna give you two definitions, emotion versus feeling. The word feeling refers to conscious awareness of the activity of the emotion system in the brain. That is our subjective experience of the emotion. So I'm feeling the emotion and then I'm understanding, having a sense of the emotion, that's my feeling, my subjective experience of it. Then sometimes we, we hear the word uh, affect with an A, A-F-F-E-C-T, affect is a word that comes from clinical psychology and psychiatry, is used in, uh, in mental status exams to reference the facial and motor expression of emotion. So if someone has an aversion towards another person, we would call that their affect. They have a micro expression of negativity or contempt or disgust, and you catch it on a, a slow motion camera, you're catching their affect. Okay, so the cognitive appraisals have to be done soon. The cognitive appraisal dimension of emotion suggests that a cognition is intrinsic to emotion and that it is an oversimplification to neatly separate cognition and emotion. So I'll say it again. The cognitive appraisal dimension of emotion suggests that cognition is intrinsic to emotion and that it is an oversimplification to neatly separate cognition from emotion. There is a working relationship between them, such that emotion oftentimes is leading to cognition, whereas a lot of times before we thought that cognition leads to emotion. More is happening. Now, 
in the limited time I have remaining, I want you to catch this. Is this is somewhat complex, but if you'll dive in, I think it'll be worth your time. You don't really have to remember all the details. I just want you to remember the concept because that'll set us up for next week. So don't, don't think, feel like you have to remember all these com- complex details, but I want you to get the overarching, broader concept. So emotion and explicit, or sorry, emotion and implicit knowledge. There are three general levels or codes of emotional information processing. The first one, A, is called subsymbolic emotional processing. Subsymbolic. When I say subsymbolic, it's beneath the level of language in the sense of using words. It's not even complex enough to have words yet. Okay? It's sub symbolic. Symbols meaning like words. Emotional processing. B. Nonverbal, symbolic, emotional processing. What would be nonverbal but symbolic? So you have, you have sub-symbolic, so it's beneath the level of symbol, uh, symbol. But then you have nonverbal, symbolic, emotional processing. And then third, C, finally, we have verbal, symbolic processing. We usually are cognizant of the level of C, verbal, symbolic processing, which means there's A and B that are beneath the surface of that iceberg we talked about. So there's a lot more happening than what we might be aware of. The first two levels are implicit forms of processing, meaning they are nonverbal codes and not under our direct control. The third code is an explicit form of processing over which we have more direct control. Can you imagine we only live and are aware of the verbal symbolic processing and we completely ignore and shut ourselves off from the first two layers or codes. So that first one, sub-symbolic processing, includes primary emotions or background emotions. I'm going to try to explain this a little bit. Primary emotions or background emotions, such as when we have a sense of well-being or a sense of malaise, meaning discomfort, or a sense of unsettledness. So these are these background emotions. This information, such as the sensation of your stomach tightening, exists in a code or language below symbols. This type of emotion is always operating in the background of our consciousness. We can think of this type of knowing as, and this is critical, as unthought knowns. That's just such a helpful phrase. Why are you laughing? Yeah, Unthought knowns. It's things you know, but they don't, they're not in the form of thoughts, like A plus B equals C, which is a format I'm very happy with. I, I like that format. But it's like, no, forget that format. We're not even going to use that. It's like, why not? If you're not using A plus B equals C, I'll never be able to understand. You're going to have to switch gears. I'm sorry, Timothy. It's just, you have to work it out. So it involves, we can think of this type of knowing as unthought knowns. It involves things we know in this particular way, but which we do not think in words. Indeed, we know much more than we can say. And this used to frustrate me a lot when I got married, because my wife would ask me, how are you doing? And I had absolutely no idea how to answer her. Very frustrating when she would ask me how I'm doing. Now, it seems like a nice question, right? Oh, she's so thick. But then the problem with her is she actually wanted an answer. And I would say, fine. And I would say, good. And she's like, she wanted a relational, emotional connection with me. She loved me. And so in order to feel intimate and close to me, she needed me to express how I felt. And I was locked into the emotional Dr. Spock idea. And I was like, I I don't know how I feel, but I I would sure love to share with you what I just read about. And if you'll listen to what I just read about, I'll feel like you love me. But she's like, yeah, that's nice, but I want to know you. How are you doing? It took years to get past that point. Like we were just deadlocked, checkmate right there. That's as far as we went for such a long time. So it involves things we know in this particular way, but which we do not think in words. Indeed, we know much more than we can say. 
that was really healthy and uh, healing for her to pursue me like that. Because when I did begin to talk about some things, and, and the way I, I finally got unlocked is that I began to do this simple thing called share my story. And when I would share my story, I was always dismissive of it. Yeah, it's just my story. Why would you want to know about that? But when she was like, no, I want to hear. Like, what do you mean you want to hear? Like, it's so boring. Why would you want to? And then I start to share it, and then she would be interested. Now, back where I come from, if everybody's going out to get into an altered state of consciousness or inebriated because corporately, collectively, we're all running from our pain, we inherently keep it shallow. And if you do that over a period of time, you're like, and then someone actually asks you how you're doing and they really want an answer, can you see how it would take time to move into this soul awareness? So my marriage, I'm I'm simply confessing that it was very healthy and healing for me. Two, nonverbal symbolic knowledge represents the second level of implicit knowledge and refers to six universal emotions. Now, the way I think of these six universal emotions, because we talked about 84 emotions before, it was 86 uh, from Mark Brackett's book. These six I think of as the alphabet that you can form. How many words are in the English dictionary? English Oxford Dictionary, like millions, right? I don't know. It's a lot. How many volumes are there? It's like 23 volumes. It's a lot. I should know this. So think of these six as the alphabet that can create a lot of words, a lot of emotions, okay? Happiness, sadness, fear, happy, sad, mad, anger, surprise, disgust. Happiness, sadness, fear, Anger, surprise, disgust. You know, we have way more words and emotions for negative than positive, it seems. Which we refer to as the brain chunking information. The primary medium of this code is imagery. So there's something that's way beneath the surface, is unthought knowns, And then the brain begins to take these and chunk them, this is the word, chunk them together so that they begin to emerge as these feelings that are communicated to us sometimes through images. Words have still not entered the picture yet. So I say here, this is why journaling out your story is so important. It allows you to process your emotions. You're starting way down deep in the well and you're drawing stuff out. You're drawing it out. So we store important emotional information in the form of emotion schemas. Emotion schemas include sub-symbolic information such as sensory, bodily, and motor information, as well as higher level symbolic information such as imagery. These emotion schemas are the fundamental organizers of emotional life in humans. They are represented through memories, fantasies, dreams, and the narratives and metaphors of our lives. Here I made made myself a note in parentheses, deep, may need to skip. And I was going to look at the clock here, and yeah, we probably need to skip that. It's page 113, you should really check it out. Um, talking about the relational domain, the experience, emotional experiences are associated with certain people clustering into a kind of emotional relational schema. And then we have these emotional patterns, like there's some complexity there. This emotion plus this emotion plus this emotion, or this feeling plus this feeling plus this feeling. So it's, it's like some kind of t- emotional tapestry. And it was formed at a certain point in our early developmental years. And then these become what I like to think of as stereotypes that we pull from. And then we use these, say we have six of them, or maybe fewer, maybe two. And we go around projecting those on people. Oh, this is a person I like. This is a person I don't like. This person's like that. And then if it's a negative thing, person we don't like, it's an association from a person in the back, in a background, in our past, and then we, we may not even realize it, but then we begin to have these visceral responses in their presence. 
And a lot of times we'll get to a certain point in the relationship and we'll cut it off and we may not even realize why we cut it off. Here's where people can sometimes run from church or run from community because perhaps the, uh, the schema, the emotional schema that it was is one of abandonment. And so we like to protect ourselves and leave the relationship before someone leaves us, something like that. But all of that could be submersive so uh, beneath the surface, the iceberg, and like you're just thinking, yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm just not into that anymore. Like I just moved on. Like, but there could be way more that's happening, such that by the time you get to middle age, you don't have a lot of depth in your relationships. For instance, okay, I'm trying to give you that's just one scenario. So we create patterns based on our experiences with our caretakers as babies, and these patterns are referenced and utilized in our analysis and evaluation of. F- for everyone else in our adult life. So we're going to get into the baby part next week. But these patterns are formed when we're very young, and then we take these patterns with us out into the world and use them to do analysis of other people. So as with implicit knowledge, these implicit relational schemas operate outside of conscious awareness. We're not even aware of them. They're based on behaviors and emotions and images. When implicit memory is retrieved, an individual does not have the experience or sense that something is being remembered. This type of knowledge tells us how to be with someone and integrates affect, cognition, and behavioral dimensions. So implicit Relating, relational knowing is evidence not only in infants, but continues throughout life in our out-of-awareness experience of how relationships work with, for us. Implicit relational knowledge forms the foundation of our knowledge of self and others because it is processed automatically and is not under the direct control of knowledge in the form of words and concepts. You could be completely oblivious to it, but yet it's, it's uh, impacting a large part of your life. So here's an example. I already gave one. That's good enough. Um, researchers tried to, here's a good illustration of this. Researchers tried to predict w- uh, which patients would reattempt suicide using two types of information. The psychiatrist's prediction written immediately after the interviews, so a psychiatrist interviewed a bunch of people, and then they wrote down which ones they thought would reattempt suicide. The psychiatrist's written predictions correctly identified whether or not a patient would reattempt for 29% of the patients, whereas the nonverbal analysis correctly classified 81% of the patients assessed. In addition, the real predictive power ended up, uh, came not from the patient's facial behavior, but from the psychiatrist's facial behavior. With patients who ended up reattempting suicide, the psychiatrist frowned and showed more animated facial expressions and a higher level of speech. Now that to me sounds like science. That sounds like something that's verifiable. Okay? So... They, they had a bunch of scientists, they interviewed a bunch of patients who had committed suicide and say, which ones do you think are going to reattempt suicide? And they wrote down after their interviews which ones they thought. 29% they were right. But they were right 81% of the time when they videotaped the psychiatrist and looked at their micro-expressions. Yeah. The psychiatrists were interviewing them. So it's not like they videotaped the patient. They, they uh, videotaped the face of the psychiatrist, which means the psychiatrist's implicit knowledge was much more accurate than their explicit knowledge. But they were not even aware of it. So they said, okay, if we videotape you and we're looking for these particular things, that means you're having a visceral reaction and you actually are worried about the re- going to reattempt suicide. Meanwhile, their explicit knowledge is not even aware of that visceral response and things are conducting the interview and is stuck in the rational, analytic, propositional analysis, writes down that analysis, and they're only right 29% of the time. That to me says there's something to this, lest we doubted it before. So infants possess far more knowledge, implicit relational knowledge, than we once thought they did. I probably have to end with this. Much of the infant research literature 
which if you get the book, chapter 3 is all about that. Much of the infant research literature demonstrates not only that infants are innately relational from day one, but also that they have a powerful, implicit, or gut-level knowing system. Infant researchers call this pre-symbolic knowledge. The parts of the brain that process this gut-level way of knowing, the right brain, implicit self, are online at birth and fully developed by about 15 months of age. For example, there is evidence that in utero, infants remember nonverbal aspects of their mother's communication, like the reading of a particular story, thus showing that they come to know their mother's voice. What's, help, what's interesting about that, and very meaningful, is that whatever the emotional state is of the mother, they're going to take on that emotional state themselves, and it will become their own. And th- with that emotional state, whether it's positive or negative, full of happiness and joy, or fear and anger, they're going to, that's going to imprint, and late next week we'll see, <clears throat> become their attachment filter, and that will be the lens through which they see the world in large part. Because remember... All those neurons are firing, like the brain's trying to figure out which ones to hold on to, which emotional circuits. So we tend to believe verbal, analytic ways of knowing are superior. That's me. However, implicit knowing actually continues throughout life and turns out to be very important in relationships. So for instance, the example he gives is, um, of this person, Kim. Kim says she wants one kind of guy in her dating relationship, but then she always ends up getting a different kind of guy. Why is that? Because her implicit knowledge is going to trump, trump her explicit. What she says she wants is not what she actually wants. And a lot of times what she wants, what she ends up actually getting is the, is the man that matches her sense of self-worth, let's say. So we can know, I have to, I have to say this, we can, and this will set us up. How, how can we believe that God is sovereign and that God is good and still be depressed? How is that possible? And all I'm saying here is to summarize every, a lot of things we've said. We can know something explicitly, but not know it implicitly. Okay? We can know all kinds of doctrine and teaching, but it hasn't changed us at our very core. So what happens is, what we're going to learn next week is these attachment filters, the way of engaging the world, and I use two negative attachment filters of stonewallers versus uh, meltdown people. Can you guess which one I am? You have no idea, right? I'm not, I'm neither. No, I was kidding. I might be one of those. If, uh, If we don't allow the truth of God's word in relationship to affect us at that level, then we are, we can end up becoming a religious person. But the fact is that, that our, the truth of Christianity never hits us at the core soul level, and so we're actually never changed. We're never transformed. So in order to know something implicitly, like God, we have to go through the process of linking feelings with words. Remember that zipper I talked about? That's just my own illustration. It's pretty wacky. We have to take that implicit and that explicit and put it together. So we're taking these feelings, something very, you know, the iceberg beneath the surface, these feelings, these emotions, we're, we're talking through them, we're processing through them. So that's why we say the idea of telling our story in the presence of an empathetic slash compassionate witness so that we can reassign the meaning of those past experiences can actually change and transform your attachment filter. And we don't even know what that is yet, but we will next week. Now, what this makes me think of is Genesis 2.19. God never told Adam to name the animals, did he? If you, I mean, look at it. It says, so out of the ground, the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. God, God creates the animals and he brings them to Adam to see what Adam would call them. And whatever that man called every living creature, that was its name. He didn't, what I take from that, and maybe I'm really off track here, off the reservation, God didn't have to say, hey Adam, name the animals. Now, the reason why God is doing this in the narrative is because he wants Adam to realize, hey, there's no one like you. 
You need a woman. You need an Eve. Because how are you going to be fruitful and multiply without someone like you? Okay, that's, that's the broader part of the narrative. But nevertheless, he brings the animals to Adam. He never has to say, name them. And what I take from that for tonight's purposes is it's, in our, it's inherent in our nature, our image-bearing nature, to name things. To organize them. And we're not doing, we're not naming things and organizing them if we're running from them and picking up negative coping strategies that make things much more cloudy. God brings the animals, and Adam inherently, because he's made in God's image and likeness, names them. Can we do that for our, for our emotions and our feelings? It seems to be in man's nature to name things. Man must learn to name his emotions and feelings. Okay, that's all we have time for. Mm, mm, mm. So we got to page, not bad. We got to page 10 out of 12. That's a record for us, okay? Uh, I can send this to you. I know I went really quickly. Here's what I want you to walk away with. It's a lot. Implicit versus explicit. Your emotions are indicating something that's beneath the surface that a lot of times we're not even aware of. I just want you to be open to that idea. Because opening to that idea allows us to be aware that maybe God has some more healing for us. I want you to be open to telling your story and working on that because I've, I've encouraged some of us to do that in the past and we have been wanting to run from that. And you can understand why we would because we expect when we tell our stories to experience more pain. I also want you, I said evangelism, you need to prepare yourself to be a listener for people in your life. People are looking for someone to pour their hearts out to a lot of the time. We need to be that for them in our broken world. I want to... I'm, um, Corey's reminding me of something I wanted to say. If you, I know this is late and it's really hard to get here. I want you to feel free to bring food here. Okay? Feel free to eat and break bread I, I, if you're hungry. Okay? All right. Um, before I stop, uh, I want to say, anybody have any questions or thoughts or like, hey, this is weird. Please don't invite me back here. Where, what, what is happening? Do you, you see why we're not doing this on Sundays, right? Any thoughts, questions, pushback? Karen? This is some good stuff. Okay, good. That's encouraging. That's encouraging. Thank you. Next week, it's, it's I think, going to get even more real. Anybody else? Kurt? I think you're on the right track. I mean, uh, that reminds me of my relationship with, with Rebecca, which I was, I was telling this, this evening was so helpful and healing for me. But I think you're on the right track. So maybe you'll give me some more insight later. Guy? Let's chat. Okay, thank you for that. Rebecca. Um, it made me think when you were talking about implicit, like a lot of like triggers or like stimulus mm-hmm. and stuff. And like even like stuff that you see people are more I like aware of the I think implicit. You know what I mean? Like with my sister Julia. I feel like she's more aware of the implicit. Yeah, yeah. I wish we could explain that more to people who don't know Julia. But yeah, yeah. So a lot of times the triggers leading to flooding is a result of uh, implicit knowledge 
that we may not be aware of, but that we, we need to become aware of. Anybody else? David or Bill or John? Anything? Okay, I'm going to run to you right after this is over. I appreciate being here, David, really. Bill, John, anything you want to say? I'm going to leave you guys out. Uh, this is this is taking this is a lot of infra, taking a lot in here. Kurt, and wrap us. Yeah. And yeah, so we don't unnecessarily sabotage relationships that would have been good and are good. Yeah. All right, we have to close. One, uh, we're an hour and 34 minutes in. It's 836, so that's pretty good. I'm going to try to get you out of here on time every week, okay? So it's I was trying to leave at 830. So I'm going to close in prayer, and then we're going to be done. Lord, this is, uh, this is a lot. It's like drinking from a fire hose, a fire hydrant. But Lord... Uh, why I marvel, and hopefully why we marvel, Lord, at this is uh, it's a chance for us to look into your design, uh, how you made us. And Lord, I just want to express praise, worship to you, gratitude, deep gratitude to you that you made us to be in relationship with you. What an honor and a privilege. Lord, not only in this life, but when the kingdom comes, we get to be in relationship with you for eternity. Lord, we look forward to that. Lord, in the meantime, by your Holy Spirit, we pray that we would reveal things that are getting in the way. Interference. Noise. That's negatively influencing our relationships or development or maturity or Christ-likeness or contributing to the community flourishing. Lord, I pray that you would restore us and heal us Lord, through our relationship with you, Lord, build us up. Lord, I pray for healing, pray for conviction, for understanding, for enlightenment. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys are dismissed, and thank you for your attention.